Okay, hello everyone, um, and welcome to our session, The Spice Must Flow Green, CNCF's Environment Sustainability Tag. Uh, my name is Sayam Patak, and I am the CNCF Environment Sustainability Tag Lead, and I work as Principal Developer Advocate at Loft Labs, uh, the creators of vCluster, uh, which is for multi-tenancy, so if you want to learn more about vCluster or multi-tenancy, then you can meet me in this jacket, not so hard to find or at the booth A6. I am Marla Warnicke. I'm one of the CNCF uh, Environmental Sustainability Tag Chairs. I'm also Prince Cloud Principal Cloud Engineer at SkedMD. Um, you can find me usually on Slack. I think today I'm booked. Tomorrow you can probably find me more easily in the afternoon. Um, we'd like to introduce our general cloud humans. In the bottom left-hand corner, um, we have this group of people that are basically running green reviews. There are other people as well. In the center, Claire, Nancy, and I don't remember how to pronounce her name, Valeria. 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 They are running our advocacy group, which is also what is called the comms group. The top right are two chair, my two co-chairs, which are Christina and Leo. Christina is new, and she's absolutely wonderful. And then on the bottom right is our other tech lead, which is Alessandra. So uh, just a bit of history like, and a bit of introduction to the tag itself, like why it is important. Um, so in general, um, I think there is a consensus. We all agree that sustainability is a very important issue across all levels. Uh, and when we talk about the software ecosystem, uh, we kind of contribute towards, as a software industry, we contribute towards like 2% of the uh, carbon emissions, which is kind of in par with the aviation industry. So you can imagine the stuff that we are uh, producing with the, by writing the softwares and deploying it on the cloud native infrastructure. And this is likely to go uh, beyond, like it's not a steady rise, it's exponential because of generative AI, more data centers, more compute requirements. Uh, but as we, uh, so. As engineers and as softwares, we are at KubeCon, it's cloud native conference, and everything is kind of being deployed to the cloud native infrastructure. So with that, there is CNCF, and CNCF acts as an umbrella to all the projects within the ecosystem that powers open source and the cloud native ecosystem. Uh, and under that, there is CNCF tag environment sustainability. Uh, that supports the project and the initiatives related to the cloud native applications, uh, including the building, packaging, deploying, managing, uh, and everything about that. So this is where the tag sustainability was created to have all the sustainable, all the projects and initiatives related to sustainability within the uh, cloud native ecosystem to fall under a single umbrella so that you can have, uh, people can work together, organizations can work together on same initiatives. Um, the tag mission statement, which is very important. Uh, the goal is basically to advocate for, develop, support, and help evaluate the environment sustainability initiatives in the cloud native technologies. And the tag will identify the values, possible in uh, incentives for the service providers to reduce their consumption and the carbon footprint through the cloud native tooling. Uh, another thing here to note is like, uh, as so you, you just imagine that you have a cloud provider and, uh, or any of the data centers that you are choosing, and then you are deploying your software on that particular uh, data center and using some of the cloud native tooling like Kubernetes. So a few things um, that TAG focuses on is uh, we would like to observe, like how we can observe the carbon emissions from what we have deployed currently as part of the applications, and then how to reduce that. So these two are, are the key, key parts. Apart from this, uh, the impact that we want to definitely create is in different areas. One is definitely the guidance uh, by providing the best practices for eco-friendly tech. Uh, then the standards, so working on the standardization of some of the tools, processes, how to measure the carbon footprint of the cloud native projects itself, which Marlo will be talking about in deep dive. Uh, collaboration, uh, how industries can come together and adopt to the greener approaches whenever they are deploying software and make it as a norm, like DevOps is kind of standard across the organization now. Platform engineering, which is the evolution of DevOps, is also becoming, you know, creating the IDPs and following the different uh, same principles and evolution on top of that. 
Similar to that, we want organizations when they are starting to write a piece of software or an API that they look for, uh, yes, these are some of the environment metrics that we have to take care of or we have to Im uh, include that as part of our workflow. Uh, I mean, it has to come as part of the, that same culture we talk about, right? DevOps is a culture that we have to adapt. Same thing, uh, we have to incorporate the environment sustainability piece into that whole uh, ecosystem, whole life cycle of the uh, software when it's shipping to production. So uh, coming next is the landscape. Uh, so with, within the tag, there is this landscape, uh, which is the sustainable cloud uh, computing landscape. Right now, if you visit the website, it's not as fancy as the CNCF landscape. But yes, we are looking for contributors to make those fancy tiles uh, and uh, create that as part of uh, the tag. Uh, so there are different areas. You have infrastructure. So you deploy the applications to the data center, so infrastructure plays a very crucial role. And there is a lot of innovation happening at the uh, data center level. Uh, Infrastructure-wise, you have uh, Kubernetes, and you can do carbon aware uh, scheduling. You can do uh, resource tuning, and you can make sure the resources that you are consuming as part of your Kubernetes clusters are at par. Like you're not wasting a lot of resources, which is, uh, if you see one of the CNCF surveys, uh, more than 70% of the enterprises uh, have stated that they have over-provisioned Kubernetes clusters. Means they are not utilizing what they have provisioned. So that also, and when you create the cluster, it adds to the CO2 emissions because it is running on a server that is consuming electricity. And there are a lot of variables that you can calculate this from as of today. Uh, then observability tooling. A lot of observability metrics and toolings are already available that are also part of the sustainability landscape. You have different uh, measurement methodologies like the SCI. Uh, Marla will discuss that as well. Um, and then the observability methodologies. For the data centers, also, since the rise in the data center is increasing exponentially because of generative AI, what is happening is, although it is a challenge that, uh, yes, we cannot have infinite number of data centers, but it also has uh, an innovation angle to it. Because whenever there's a challenge, people will think on it and people will try to find a solution for that. Uh, so with that, the in the data center space, there's open compute project, which has an efficient cooling system. Uh, so you can have the open compute servers, and they are rapidly evolving. 97% uh, of the data center heat uh, goes out. 97% uh, of the data center uh, electricity consumed goes out as heat. That can be reused and uh, be used for heating up swimming pools. And I'm not saying that uh, this is a hypothesis. This is in practice. So there is a company called Deep Green. Uh, that actually does that uh, currently in, in London and EU region. Uh, they have this system where you have GPUs and everything in place, and the AI model that you are running, the AI inferencing that you are running is actually heating up the swimming pool in a, uh, where a person is actually swimming. So it's, it's very cool. So things are evolving from the data center perspective as well, which is, which is good because uh, as sustainability, as the demands are rising, need for sustainability is rising, so is the innovation. And so are the number of tools, and hence we have the landscape. Um, on the observability tooling side, uh, you have various uh, open source projects like G-Profiler, Power API, Python Framework, Kepler, uh, which I'll be talking more about in one of the next sessions, uh, which is in 245 level four, uh, level two and 2.30 PM. I'll be talking more about uh, deep dive about Kepler and Cube Green and how you can, how as an enterprise you can use the combination of tools from this ecosystem to measure um, and implement after going. Like you come here as an enterprise and you say, okay, yeah, I learned a bunch of tools today, but how do I implement that? Uh, so that's what I'll be discussing over there. Coming back, uh, you have green metrics tool, you have cloud carbon footprint where you have diff you, ca you can uh, see the impact of uh, your cloud resources, your different cloud resources connected to that and see what all um, state, what is the state of the uh, carbon footprint of the stuff that you are using. Influx uh, data, telegraph collector, uh, you have NVIDIA in that as well. Uh, that gives you the DRAM metrics and the CPU uh, carbon emissions, carbon QL, power top, all this stuff is, is pretty cool and it's actually the part of the landscape that you can start using open source projects. 
coming to the infrastructure level, so you can do a lot of different type of scaling. You can do carbon aware scaling. You can do CADA as an efficient auto scaling mechanisms, um, and you can also do resource tunings with uh, Kubernetes Power Manager, extensible Power Manager. So a lot uh, is there in the infrastructure as well. So this is like, uh, so I hope you got the gist of what the why we are talking about sustainability, what is tax sustainability, and right now the current landscape within the tax sustainability. And now I hand over to Marlo. So we have various groups that are working within our tag. Um, one of them is Working Group Green Reviews. And um, the question was, how can we measure the software carbon intensity of, of cloud-native software? Now, this particular metric was put out by Green Software Foundation. It's very, very simple. It's just energy consumed by software in kilowatts, carbon emitted per kilowatts of energy, um, the carbon emitted through the hardware that the software is running on, and then there's a functional unit, which is how it scales, uh, for example, per user or per device. <laughs> and the aim of Green Reviews it was to set up infrastructure to measure the sustainable footprint of various projects. And that includes various benchmarks or whatever uh, sorts of workloads you're expecting. Um, this is their vision statement. So our vision is that the working group will compute the sustainability data for every release of a CNCF project that requests a sustainability footprint. Um, to achieve this, there is a workflow in development, it's most of the way there, um, that can integrate well with the existing software lifecycle of other CNCF projects. This is the general, and I'm, I'm not going to go through this, um, but we can discuss later, you can join the, the Green Reviews group. But the, the key part is we're using an Equinix infrastructure, which is what is used for various uh, CNCF projects to test on. They are very nice. They donate compute time for clusters. So there's the CNCF cluster that CNCF projects have access to. And um, we're using a, a workflow that uses that with open tofu. And um, our first uh, pilot project was to measure the use of power on Falco with various benchmarks. How can you join and contribute? There is a Slack channel. Um, there are twice monthly meetings where they discuss plan and assign work. So every first and third uh, Wednesday is the normal CNCF environmental sustainability tag meeting. They do the other weeks. Um, and these we'll put up later. Go to the next one. There's the, uh, one of the second working groups we have is the advocacy comms goals. And here, here we're trying to establish an advocacy strategy for tag environmental sustainability and then execute that. So we have a whole bunch of different types of events that we run. Um, we collaborate with other sustainability projects, produce sustainability partnerships and marketing materials. And this was initially the comms group. So this was to get our web page in order, you know, start the blog post, maintain the social media, and it has grown and also commu communicate the results of projects, cloud native sustainability reviews. There's a link here that is to our Slack for that particular group. And these are the different advocacy roles. So we have social media, we have blogs, we have the website, we have events, and then the really big one is we have the sustainability week, which I think you discuss later. The third project that we're actively working on currently is sustainability in AI. This is a paper. Uh, we need help. We're still trying to get all the different avenues because AI is complicated. These are the various, uh, it is a partnership between our tag and the Runtime's uh, Cloud Native AI Working Group. And here are our goals. Highlight the need for sustainable practices, examine the challenges of AI computational dash demands, outline core components of sustainable AI systems, and provide best practices and future insights. We're not going to have solutions in this. There's not a lot of tooling available, but we can write about what is currently there and what areas we need to attack. The dimensions we're using for examination include deployment environments, types of AI systems, the AI lifecycle, and then also personas. Who is using this and how can they personally influence the sustainability of the AI systems? So uh, one of the initiatives uh, that was uh, that is there is the Sustainability Week, uh, which is actually celebrated in the October uh, month. Second, this time it was second week of October, and it's basically uh, uh, as part of the 
the initial tax statement that I told, like, um, you know, advocacy, which means, like, we want people to know about what the tag is, how they can currently measure some of the carbon metrics using the ex existing open source tooling uh, from the uh, open source projects which are there. Some of them are under CNCF, some of them are independent, uh, but as part of the tag sustainability landscape, they fall under that. Uh, so these are some of the pictures from uh, the events uh, across the globe that happened uh, this year as part of the Cloud Native Sustainability Weeks, promoting the eco-friendly cloud native practices and the tooling and how some of the organizations are also currently using them. Uh, we also had a lot of virtual events um, so as part of the uh, Sustainability Week. Uh, and then we have the blog and the communication. So again, we need, as part of the tag, uh, it's, it's a young uh, technical advisory group within the CNCF ecosystem, and we need more and more uh, people to kind of contribute to it. And that is why we have different contributions area, ranging from code uh, to uh, blogs, to social media, to managing the communication, and all sorts of co uh, contributions are very welcome and highlighted as well. Uh, so one of them is blogs uh, and communication. So whatever uh, people are doing with respect to the projects or with respect to sustainability week, uh, we try to capture that as part of the blogs that goes out and uh, it raises obviously the awareness um, and we also get, we are trying to increase the number of blogs. So uh, if any one of you wants to join the tag, then definitely be part of it as uh, code contributors to the projects that we are driving or the workflows that we are writing as part of green reviews or as part of the advocacy programs of blogs and communication. I should also mention before we go to questions that we have a booth in the uh, within the project tables, project pavilion. yeah, the project pavilion. So you can come talk to p us or other people that are also involved. Yeah, there's a project pavilion area. So when when you enter, uh, you go right, and then the in the end kind of area, it's a whole project pavilion, uh, which has the CNCF project boots and the tag boots. So one of them is tag sustainability, and there will be someone standing over there from the tag. Uh, right now, also there will be someone standing. Uh, who will be able to help you answer questions, get you onboarded if you want to in the tag, uh, be part of it. So generally the main main uh, question that I get, and I would like to just take it before anyone asks is, uh, like how do I get involved? One is definitely joining the Slack. Uh, two is joining the meetings, because whenever you are joining a particular tag, you can feel overwhelmed with the number of projects that I just shown in the landscape, like where do I contribute, where do I go? So just join the tag and join the tag sustainability meetings. There you get a chance to introduce yourself, you get a chance to learn about what is currently happening within the ecosystem, what all projects currently are being worked upon, what all uh, practices currently are being be, uh, worked upon. And you, uh, if you have uh, your own proposal, you can also submit your proposal within the uh, tag environment sustainability under CNCF that this is something uh, we have. Like the AI white paper came very recently. It's not, uh, it's this year itself that it came, like a few months back. Uh, so like these initiatives comes in, uh, there was one which is now not worked on again due to lack of uh, contributors is the Kubernetes best practices. We wanted to build something, the Kubernetes best practices uh, to be followed with respect to the sustainable principles. So like that, people come up with innovative ideas and innovative things, and then, um, you know, and there is a path, like you, you drive up, uh, you come in as a contributor and you can be uh, the TL and the, the, you know, tag chairs, co-chairs um, for the tag. I think that that is something which, which I wanted to highlight. Yeah, questions. Uh, one on the right takes you to the website, and one on the left takes you to the feedback, I think so. Either that or I did the Slack channel. I don't remember yeah. which one. <laughs> so yeah, that, that was something um, about the environmental tax sustainability under CNCF. If you have any questions, please let us know. Yeah, uh, that's a very good point. Um, so 
the landscape that we have is not uh, like exclusive like this is the only these are the only tools which are there so yes there uh, there is web assembly in general uh, which has a smaller footprint and which near native speeds and you can run it side by side the uh, the containers and it reduces it adds to the sustainability efforts and if you see uh, the sustainability in wasm we actually did a stream as part of uh, the you know, uh, sustainability week with Kate from Fermion, uh, who is a big advocate for uh, sustainability and WebAssembly. So yes, WebAssembly is a part and, and it helps um, within the uh, Kubernetes ecosystem, serverless ecosystem, scaling to zero and then cluster auto scale triggering in and then removing those nodes and then coming back up. Uh, you can have intelligent auto scalers. Today there was a talk about queue, so you can have that queue in place as well. So a lot of uh, like I said, these tools are there, but you need to kind of intelligently pick the tools and use them in conjunction to observe and then reduce. I will say we have a gap in the landscape on WASM, so if you want to come yes. show up and help us, we would love that. I'm not a WASM expert. I'm expert in other areas. I'm not sure we have any WASM experts in the tag that are currently involved. Yeah, I, I have yeah. been in the in the WASM space for a couple of years. I mm -hmm. published a WebAssembly course uh, with respect to Cloud Native this year in January. So yeah, I, I would if you want to if anyone wants to join in, I would be happy to help in getting the landscape in for WebAssembly. Hi. Yeah, I know this is focused more on uh, Kubernetes best practices and what we do from that end, but I'm curious. Uh, about how you're actually measuring emissions and sustainability. Um, I know there's some debate in the industry over whether, uh, for example, you can purchase 100% of your power from a nearby coal plant, um, but then buy renewable energy certificates from, uh, say, a wind farm in Nebraska and achieve like reduced scope two emissions. I'm curious, does that count? Like, what approach are you using to measure? So if you're using a service provider, sometimes they tell you how green the energy is and sometimes they don't. And trying to get the actual amount of energy is difficult because um, sometimes you only get quarterly reports depending on the cloud. So that is a challenge in that space. If you have any suggestions, I would love to hear them. But I do think it's important where you get those. I, there is definitely a difference in where your workload is running and what the power or the carbon cost is. So I think that depends on what the local laws are. I would love to see that, but you have to incentivize it somewhere. And so when you talk about carbon credits that are being charged in Europe, if they're doing it to the companies that are running the workloads, then the, the, it just to run on a cloud provider, they'll have to provide those metrics. So I think some of the upcoming uh, regulations will force that to be there, but until it, there is a monetary reason to do that, I. The cloud providers, you know, it's a nice to have, but they have other things to do. And with the AI explosion, they're focused on that. Yeah, uh, to, to that point, I would like to again go back to, to this, uh, which is uh, making Kubernetes more sustainable one cluster at a time. Uh, so this particular um, you know, session was focused mainly on how you can reduce the number of Kubernetes clusters, which would definitely reduce, one, the cost, and second, the impact on the sustainability. And there are projects and initiatives like uh, Kubernetes multi-tenancy, how you can run multiple Kubernetes clusters within the same cluster so that you can improve the resource efficiency. And these are also part of the landscape, uh, the resource tuning. So if you see the uh, scaling, scheduling, and resource tuning, uh, some of this comes under this. Yes, they're not exactly uh, entirely uh, tagged with cost 
red, red, uh, you know, reducing the cost. But yes, if you use the resources efficiently within the Kubernetes cluster, you are eventually using less number of Kubernetes cluster, which is reducing the cost. So the issue with that is we don't have that many base scientists in the CNCF, and you need people who understand how to do measurement to do that. If we get people that understand that the base science background, and you know my 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 first background is science and measurement, it would be helpful. But we don't really have those people there to help with those. Um, I would like to see the green reviews project after we're done figuring out how to measure according to the Kepler measurements, find a way to validate uh, so someone comes out with a new measurement tool. Is it correct? Because the other piece that isn't, being, that isn't being measured very well has to do with networking and storage. That data transfer is expensive. The switches are very nice base heaters that happen to move packets. So when you're, <laughs> when you're looking at how the, me the measurements are going, they're not really... We need to be more intelligent about it. So if we find more scientist type people to go engage, that would be great. But it's available, you know, it's availability from who we have as volunteers. So no, there aren't any you're aware of no. where that's because of the lack of base scientists, yeah. Yeah. The yeah. tools like Kepler, the, yes, definitely you can measure the uh, carbon footprint from um, the Kubernetes clusters, the, the tools like Kepler help you that. But like Paolo said, the research that whether this metrics and how what is the accuracy for the metrics is something that is in progress and we need more kind of research scientists over there and more domain expertise folks. So uh, <clears throat> I've always heard that uh, workloads tend to like be more energy efficient on ARM than x86. Is that actually proving to be true in the field with Kubernetes workloads? I don't know, but I will tell you that Kubernetes is highly inefficient because of the way it does the resource scheduling. So in order to, like, I look at things as different buckets of things that we can fix as far as, you know, the general picture. Um, it is possible that some AR and chip, AR ARM chips have less, but you also have the E and P cores now with the newer chips coming out, and I think uh, AMD has a similar thing where there's the efficiency cores. And so if, when you look at those measurements, yeah, the companies put out their own measurements as far as the compute. But as far as Kubernetes on top of it, I can't answer you, and I haven't seen anything on it. It would be really nice, because Equinix specifically, that's kind of nice that that's up. Um, the Equinix specifically, you can choose what type of uh, chip you're running on. So it might be fun to do that once we get this infrastructure fully in. Cool. Yeah, I was mainly just wondering because mm -hmm. my company's planning a large edge project and like x86 versus ARM64 is a very open question at this point. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for attending the talk and giving your time and listening to us.